Welcome to my introduction to networking course, typically abbreviated ITN. This will be for the CCNA version 7 curriculum. Module 3, Protocols and Models. So the main focus of this is we're going to talk about the rules for communication, protocols, protocol suites, standards, and we're going to end with reference models and how all of this ties together with data encapsulation. So you're going to notice a big thing with this lesson is actually it's about understanding the importance and the role of communication and how the protocols and standards actually help facilitate that communication. Essentially, the rules for communication are those protocols and standards. So essentially, within communication, we're going to have a source, that's going to be the sender. We have a destination, that's going to be the receiver. And there's going to be a channel or a media that is used to provide the path for communication. So this is how uh, basic communication functions. The structure of how to communicate is equally important. And that's going to be things like what language, what speed, how do we uh, address errors, how do we address who's talking and who's listening. So that's where communication protocols come into play. Because essentially what we have to have is that structure. So communication is governed by, again, that structure. They are the rules. These rules will vary depending on which type of protocol we have. If we're dealing with human communication, we may have nonverbal protocols. We look at each other and we know not to be disrespectful so we don't talk over one another. If one person is speaking one language, we speak that language. Well, with digital communication, it's not quite that simple. So we actually have to define rules. So rule establishment. Basically, individuals must establish rules or an agreement to govern the conversation. These are formalized rules. If uh, we don't have formalized rules, then we have issues. For example, here the first message is difficult to read because it's not formatted. There's not a lot of punctu uh, punctuation. It's also in multiple languages. Where with the second example, it actually is showing a properly messaged, a properly formatted message with proper language understanding. So there's two types of rules. We're talking formalized rules and de facto rules. Formalized rules are agreed upon structured rules. De facto rules are rules because they, we've just always done it that way. They're not standard, they're just there because that's how we've done them. So protocols must account for very specific requirements. We have to identify who's going to send, who's going to receive. The structure with sending and receiving so we can make sure that we do not talk over one another. Common language. Here, punctuation and grammar for talking, actual person-to-person -person communication, speed, timing of the delivery as well, error correction if necessary. If we are talking and something occurs, how do we recover from an error? I know error is not on the list, but that's also equally important. And lastly, confirmation or acknowledgement that we agree upon these rules. So. This is the breakdown for rule establishment. So in network or digital communication, same very similar things have to be agreed upon. We have to talk about how it's going to be encoded and decoded. Talking about the formatting and the structure of it, the size of communication, how large of a chunk of data can we send on a media, the timing on the media and are there delivery options. So let's go ahead and let's talk about message encoding. Basically the encoding is the process of converting information into another acceptable form of transmission. Basically if we're going to send it over the wire, how are we going to be able to send it over the wire 
and have the receiver take it, decode it, and be able to handle the message. Again, decoding is the reverse process of encoding. Encoding will be taking it and converting it, and then decoding will be converting it back. Next would be message formatting and encapsulation. So when there's a message being sent, there has to be a specific format, like when you're mailing a letter, source and destination and where the stamp goes, all of that plays an equal part in delivery. So here, we have to look at the digital format, and they're called headers. Here we have a header for a packet. It lists things like the version, the traffic class, the flow label. That stuff's not as important, but that's part of the structure of that packet header. So as long as we understand that there is a structure for how we send the data, we are good. Message format will always depend on the type of message and the channel that is being used for delivery. If we are sending a datagram using an IPv4 packet, we're going to use an IPv4 packet header. If we're sending it using IPv6, then we have to use an IPv6 packet header. So there are slightly different rules depending on how we are sending data. Next would be message size. We have to make sure that the formatting is appropriate to the media and that the size is appropriate to the media. Because again, the message sent across the network has to be converted into a digital signal so that it can be sent across the media. The media being the actual wire, the copper cable, the fiber optic, or the wireless connection, things of that nature. So again, we may have to break this down into more manageable chunks. The message size may have to be smaller to make sure it fits on the wire. You cannot send a large package if the media cannot handle that size package. Moving on would be message timing. So message timing would include very specific action items, flow control, response time, and access method. The flow control will be the rate of transmission. How fast can we send it? The response for time will manage how long the device waits when it doesn't hear a reply from the destination. Hey, did you get these three packets I sent? How long should I wait until I resend those three packets? And that's assuming error correction is there. So lastly would be access method, and this will determine when someone can send a message. If we have two people and they're talking at the same time, that's a collision. However, if we define who talks and who listens and the rules that govern that, that's going to be the access method. When we have two things talking on a digital network, it is still called a collision. And the collision basically forms a data corruption. The message doesn't get delivered because it was colliding with another message. It was corrupted. Next, we're going to have to talk about delivery options. So when we're sending a message on a digital network, even with people, are we sending it to a one-to-one? -one? Are we sending it to a one-to-many? Or are we sending it to one-to-everyone? Meaning, if we're talking a person communication, am I talking one-on-one? -on -one? If I am, that's going to be equivalent to unicast. That is one message to one person. If we are talking to a small select group, maybe I want to choose everyone wearing sneakers, wearing a t-shirt, whatever criteria we select, and I want to send a message to them, that's going to be unicast. That is one to many, typically not to everyone. If I want to talk to everyone, that's going to be a broadcast. And again, that's one to everyone. Some things may show as icons. I've actually never seen this, but basically if you're looking at this, one-to-one -one unicast, one-to-many would be multicast. Again, look at the arrows, and one-to-everyone would be broadcast. Moving on is our protocols. So the network protocols define the common set of rules 
and that can be implemented on hardware, software, or both of them. And the protocols, each protocol, may have their own function, formats, and rules. So we have a few different types of protocol types. Network communication, network security, routing, and service discovery. Network communication will allow for one or more devices to communicate over a shared network. Network security will be securing the data to provide basic authentication, integrity, and confidentiality. That will be CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and authentication, or availability through authentication. Basically, you're gonna verify who you are, you're gonna make sure that the data is not uh, modified in transit, and that it's held secure. Routing will enable routers to exchange information for path selection. And lastly, service discovery, that will be used to, for the automatic detection of devices or services on the network, assuming they can be automatically found. So again, these are just a few different protocol types and kind of their functions. In communication, in digital communication, as we grow, we actually have way more protocol types that exist. So when we're looking at the protocols, again, they each have their own functions. Addressing, reliability, flow control, sequencing, error detection, application interface, uh, interface, and things of that nature. These basically allow devices to use the agreed upon protocol and the functions of that protocol. Not every protocol will have all of these. Some may have multiple, but not all of them. So it just kind of depends on, again, the protocol and what the protocol does. And again, like addressing is going to be identifying a sender and receiver based off of a physical or logical. Reliability is about reliable connectivity or guaranteed delivery. Flow control is about how much we're sending and the efficiency rates. Sequencing will be like our numbering or our labeling. Error detection, that's pretty straightforward. And interface is going to be how we actually interact with one another. So, protocol interaction. How do the protocols interact with one another? So the networks require the use of several protocols for communication. Here we have a four stack communication. We actually have HTTP, that's going to be the application protocol that we interact with. That's typically our web browser. We're going to have a transmission protocol, TCP. This will manage the individual conversations and manage flow. We have IP, and that's going to be used to send the data to an external source, like a web server. And then we're going to have a physical access method known as Ethernet, and this will deliver the message from our network adapter to our router, and then from there, it will be sent either via IP or Ethernet through our ISP to our destination, and so forth. Moving on, we have our protocol suites. These are the groups of protocols, and this is a group of identified interrelated protocols necessary for communication. Protocols can work by themselves or as groups. Protocols are viewed in terms of their layer. Are we talking higher layer or lower layer? And that kind of depends on what their functionality is doing. Here we have the same breakdown that we had earlier. We have the application, which is a higher layer. We had our transport, which was again, how it went through the network and it managed our sessions. We had internet, which was how it connected to the destination, and then we had our network access. So again, we used Ethernet, we used IP, TCP, and HTTP. This right here is known as a reference model. This happens to be the TCP IP reference model, and communication is broken down into four layers. However, TCP IP reference model is one of two major types of reference models. The OSI is the Open System Interconnection model, and that is the second major type. Within any Cisco course, you will learn about the OSI reference model 
because that's how we relate everything back to it. In following uh, videos, we're going to be talking about data communication as it refers to the OSI reference model. They start off with TCP because it's a little bit simpler. Again, TCP IP will operate at the application, transport, and internet layers, and it will use the most common network access for connectivity. The network access will be whatever our network is running, and almost all networks will run Ethernet. Ethernet is our layer 2 technology, and that's actually how we put data on our network. So the TCP IP protocol suite is made up of several protocols. How we define our application protocols, they break, uh, they break them down into like uh, name systems, hosts, email, and so forth. Here is the different groups for the transport layer, and again the protocols that operate them, and at the internet layer. And again, they break them down into internet protocols, messaging, and routing protocols. Here is the overall structure of how we deal with the different protocols at each of the layers of the TCP IP model. So at this level, you don't really need to know each of the protocols, but it starts helping to start looking at the common protocols. Because there are so many protocols to learn and we're going to be breaking them down as we discuss each of the layers. So within our communication, each layer actually will engulf the layer above it. So that's called our encapsulation. Here we have a data. This will be HTTP. It will be engulfed with TCP. TCP will completely surround it. IP will completely surround the TCP and data unit, and then Ethernet will completely surround it. From there, and that Ethernet group will be broken into bits, and it'll be sent to the destination, and they will de-encapsulate it. They'll break it down, they'll ungroup it from Ethernet to IP to TCP back to data. So that is how the encapsulation packet or the encapsulation process works in a nutshell. We're going to break it down a little bit simpler by the end of this video, but for now, that's kind of the functionality. Let's talk about standards organizations. We have lots of standards, and each standards are managed by a group. These uh, groups are typically nonprofits, and they are classified as open standards. The standards allow for interoperability, competition, and innovation. And they should be vendor neutral, nonprofits, and they help to establish and develop these standards. Things like IEEE, IANA, INTF, uh, TIERA, uh, ITU, or ICANN. Each of these groups provide vendor neutral structure to communication. For example, we have the Internet Society, ISOC. From there, we have the Internet Architect Board, IAB. IAB actually breaks down certain things into different groups. We have an Internet Engineering Task Force. We have an Internet Research Task Force. And again, they're separate. They do specific things. The uh, Internet Engineering Task Force will help develop, update, and maintain Internet and TCP IP protocols where the Internet Research Task Force focuses more on long-term research related to the Internet and TCP. So again, they structure this in such a way so that we have certain groups that govern how we function, how the Internet functions, how TCP IP functions, and so forth. We have basic Internet standards. We have ICANN. This coordinates IP address allocation and the management of domain names and assignment to other information. Then we have the Internet Assigned Number Authority, IANA, and they oversee them and manage IP address allocations and domain name management and protocol identified for ICANN. So ICANN manages it, but ICANN's too big, so ICANN kind of forms out some of the requirements and the management to IANA. 
that just shows us the structure of what they're doing. So things like domain names, addresses, things like that, IANA and ICANN are in charge of. So moving on, we have a few other electronic and communication standards like IEEE, IA and TIA. They make up a lot of our physical media standards. We have an international telecom uh, union, ITU, and those focus on video compression, IPTV, broadband communication, and DSL. Uh, IA TIA also outline our physical wire layout, our pinout for our cabling. We have a lab. So let's go ahead and let's dive into our reference model. Again, our reference model is how we tie back communication flow conceptually to the actual communication flow. We have two major models that we need to know about, TCP IP and OSI. OSI has seven layers, application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. And they correspond to the TCP IP models, application, transport, internet, and network access. So you can compare and contrast the two models. You'll see that for OSI, the top seven, six, and five layers line up with TCP's fourth layer. These three are this single layer. They have matching transport and they have matching network or internet layers. And then the network access is the data link and physical layers lining up. So the nice thing with these reference models is within later lessons, we actually have a detailed breakdown of each of these layers because we reference almost everything back to these layers. So the middle middle portion is about being able to understand what protocols operate at those layers. So we know if we're talking HTTP, we know that's going to be in the application presentation and session uh, layer groups. If we're talking TCP or UDP, we know that's going to be the transport or transport layer for the OSI or the TCP IP model. If we are talking IP or ICMP, it will be the OSI network or the TCP internet layer. If we're talking Ethernet, we know it is either data link physical or the network access, kind of depending on if OSI or TCP. But everything we go back to will reference this model. OSI is going to be one of the more important ones because within the Cisco material, that is one that is covered the most. The benefits of using a layered model is it assists in protocol design because the protocols that operate at a specific layer have defined information to act upon. It fosters completion because products from different vendors can work together. It does prevent technology or uh, capability changes in one layer from affecting things in another layer. Lastly, it does provide a common language to describe networking functions and capability. This is one slide that I recommend most people hand write out. Understand the layer numbers, understand the layer names, and understand the general description at each layer. You need to know that the application layer contains protocols used for processing to process communication, host to host. This is also where the uh, user interacts with the application. Presentation is where we pr uh, represent data to the application. This also includes data transfer to an application layer services. Session provides services for the presentation layer and to manage data exchange. Transport will define services for segment, transfer, and reassemble of individual communication links. The network layer provides services to exchange individual pieces of data over a network. Data link will describe the method for exchanging data frames over a common media. And physical 
describes the mean to activate, maintain, and deactivate physical connections for digital communication. Don't worry, we actually have later slides coming, later lessons coming up that will break this down even further. We have our TCP IP reference model, and again, how they correlate, because we need to understand the comparison. Layers 7, 6, and 5 correlate to the application layer for TCP. Layer 4 correlates to the transport layer. Layer 3 correlates to the internet layer. And layers 2 and 1 correlate to the network access layer. We have a fax tracer lab kind of helping to explore this type of traffic. Moving on is our data encapsulation. So when we're looking at the OSI model or the TCP IP model, as data flows through the layers, as they move from layer six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, as they go down, they actually encapsulate into the lower layers. So part of this is we have to talk about why encapsulation is so important. One of the big parts there is segmentation. Taking a chunk of data and making it smaller so that we can ensure efficiency of our delivery. If data is so large, it may be hard to send. So if we de uh, break it up into smaller chunks, it will increase the speed and it may lead to increased efficiency. Within our segmentation, we need to number them. That's called sequencing. Basically is we number each segment so that when the receiver gets them, they can put them back. The sequencing number actually helps put them back in order. This is one slide that you definitely want to know out of this lecture. Here is what we would call the data groups as they flow down. The data groups are also sometimes called a protocol data unit, a PDU. So, layer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Data is layers 7, 6, and 5 of the OSI. Segment is layer 4, packets are layer 3, frames are layer 2, bits are layer 1. We need to be able to reference the OSI model against these PDUs. As we're talking a layer 3 data group, it's going to be a packet. If we're talking layer 2 data group, we need to know that it's a frame. So we need to understand this structure. Data encapsulation, literally we take data and we engulf it in a segment. The segment is engulfed in a packet. The packet is engulfed by a frame, and then the frame is put into bits. Here you'll see that this is, here's the data. The data is put into a, a segment by adding a transport header. The transport header and data is put into a packet by adding the network header. And then the network header, transport, and data is put into a frame by a frame header, and it ends with the frame trailer. That is what it means by encapsulation. Here's a different view. This is an envelope. The data gets put into the TCP envelope. The TCP envelope gets put into the IP envelope. The IP envelope gets put into the Ethernet envelope. And so these are each large envelopes that are placed in one another. Then, as we send data to our receiver, they would de-encapsulate it. Basically, they do the reverse. They will get the bits, they'll make the bits into a frame, they'll remove the frame header to expose the packet, they'll look at the packet detail, they'll take off the packet header, they'll have a segment. From the segment, they'll pull that off, and they will put in data. And the data stream is what our application will be using. Moving on is our data access. Basically, our addressing for our data access 
both the data link and the network layers use addressing to deliver data. The network layer source and destination is responsible for delivering logical addressing known as IPs. The data link layer source and destination are physical addresses and they are used for communication on the same network. Physical we're looking at timing and synchronization. Data link is source and destination physical address. At the network layer we're looking at source and destination logical addressing. At the transport layer we're looking at what ports we're using and the all of the upper layers 5, 6, and 7. That's all about encoding data. Our layer 3 logical address, source and destination, are going to be IP addresses. These addresses may be on the same link or they could be an external address. There are two major types, IPv4 or IPv6. The nice thing is, as we send data to the internet, it's going to be as IPv4 data packets. When we look at a IPv4 address, we have two sections. We have the part that's attached to the network, and we have parts that attach to the host. Basically, with this, we are looking at the host portions being all of the computer addresses on our LAN. So we could say that PC1, that maybe the first three groups of numbers are part of the network portion, and only the fourth one is part of the host. Basically, that means the network portion would not change, only the host portion would change. Don't fret, we actually have a lesson talking about the network portion versus the host portion uh, coming up. Devices on the same network would use our physical addresses, our MAC addresses. So here we have an example of PC1 and FTP server. You'll notice that the network numbers are the same and only the host bits are different. These are on the same network. So we rely on our data link address, our physical address, to do our local communication. So let's go to look at the larger role here. So when a device on the same Ethernet network the data link frame will use the actual MAC address of the destination NIC because it's all local. And that means the source address of the originating link will use its local address. When we're sending to the destination, it will use the destination. So it's important because when we start talking about what happens when we need to leave the network, then our frame, our physical address, will actually use the destination MAC address of our router. From our router, it will actually then use the next hop MAC address. So here we have a frame. The frame is sent to the router. The router will remove the frame and then add its own frame with the next hop with this address. This router will receive the frame, then it will remove the frame. It will then replace it with the next hop's MAC address. While the IP addresses stay the same, the MAC addresses change. So the role of the network layer address is about being able to stay active as it flows through the network. Because each time the router receives the frame, it's the router will actually look at the layer 3 address, the IP address. And when it knows, oh, I need to send this IP address to that router, it will use its layer 2 information. 
So the default gateway is basically an exit point. We're going to run through this. So PC1 wants to send data over to this web server. The PC will send it to this IP address. This is the destination. This is the source. This is the source MAC address. The destination MAC address will be the default gateway, it will be the router. It will be this, this one. R1 will get it. So here, destination 101, because it's the default gateway. Apparently, we're not going to go all the way through. So what ended up happening is R1 should take it as it's the default gateway, and then it will replace it each time with the physical address of the next hop, the next device. The IP addresses will always remain the same, only the MAC addresses will change each time we go through a layer 3 boundary. So the data link address here, we will use the layer 2 address of the router. The router will then strip it out, look at the layer 3 address, and then forward it accordingly. Going back to layer 2, it will use the layer 2 address, this guy. So the second router will pull it out, it will strip away the frame, it will look at the IP address, and then it will use the next hop, layer 2 address, to send it down the line. All the way through. So we will have a lab for installing Wireshark. We will have a lab going through analyzing local and remote ICMP data traffic using Wireshark. And that is it for this lesson. We learned about the rules, the protocols, the suites, basic standard organizations, the reference models, data encapsulation, data access. The big two to take away from this is the reference model and the PDUs. Those are two things we need to understand. And that is this chapter in a nutshell. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out.